I'd like to welcome to you to Discover Alaska Lecture Series. This event is sponsored by Summer Sessions and Lifelong Learning. 
and the UAF Geophysical Institute. If I could ask everyone to please silence their cell phones at this time. If you need the restroom, it's exit the auditorium, go to the left to the exit sign, and you'll see them off to the left. A few announcements. Tomorrow night we have them folkers, which will feature bluegrass, folk music, and blues covers. They'll be at Museum of the Gardens, Georgia's and Botanical Garden, 7 p.m. Rain or shine, help or shine. Tired of rain. Next week, Magical Mondays will be about using unmanned aerial systems to study the Alaska environment. They'll have a real-life UAV there flying around in the auditorium, so it should be really cool. Healthy Living Tuesdays will have a lecture on dangers of antibiotic overuse. Tonight, we are very honored to have Mr. Tom Walker here to talk about the history of the Kantishna Mining District. Mr. Walker has worked in many different fields as a conservation officer, a wilderness guide, wildlife technician, log home builder, documentary film advisor, and an adjunct professor of journalism at the Homer branch of University of Alaska Anchorage. He is a full-time freelance writer, photographer specializing in natural history and wildlife, is regarded as one of Alaska's premier nature photographers. His publication credits include Alaska Magazine, Field and Stream, Outdoor Life, Newsweek, Audubon, Sierra, Natural History, National Wildlife, Ranger Rick Magazine, Wilderness, and numerous national and local international publications. That was a lot, sorry. In 2013, the Alaska Historical Society awarded Mr. Walker with the title of Historian of the Year for The 70 Mile Kid, his biography of Harry Carstens, the first superintendent of Denali, then known as McKinley National Park. After his talk, um, he'll be opening the floor to some questions, and then one-on-one -on -one with anyone who'd like to stay after. So please now join me in welcoming Mr. Tom Walker. After that long list of occupations, you could say I failed at a lot of different things since I've been in Alaska. <clears throat> I'm happy to be here this evening. I won this Historian of the Year Award last year, and I was quite embarrassed by it, actually, because I'm not really a historian in the sense that, say, Terence Cole is, or even Dermot, who have spent their whole lives studying history and being involved in history. In fact, some people said, well, what are you even doing delving into history? Because you're a wildlife guy. You've worked for Fish and Game, and you've volunteered for the Fish and Wildlife Service, and you've chased animals all over Alaska. But what, why are you even looking into history? My first year at Denali Park, and then it was McKinley National Park, and you had to drive in the old Denali Highway, and if you got in there, you earned it to be there, and you could drive anywhere you wanted to go, was July 4th, 1969. And I've been kind of hanging out there ever since. I'm kind of a hanger-on. I've never worked for the Park Service, don't want to work for the Park Service, never will work for the Park Service. I just fell in love with a place. And it was a dream to me. I'd grown up reading about the mountain men, the pioneers of the West, and I came to Mount McKinley National Park, and here were all of these animals in this untrampled landscape. July 4th, 1969, I saw in the whole day I was there three vehicles, a dump truck and one passenger vehicle and a pickup truck, and that's all we saw. And that evening it snowed, and the next day I went back in the park, saw 1,500 animals in a single day migrating caribou in the snow, all sheep on the peaks. It was like magic kingdom. You could spend the whole summer there th these years now in the current era and you could spend the entire summer and not see 1,500 animals all summer long. It's changed quite a bit. <clears throat> While I was out chasing around after moose and whatever, as I'm sure Kenny has and Ron has and some of you, you've seen ruins. You've seen cabins, you've seen trails. 
you stop at the top of Stony Dome and look out over the plains there and there's a trail that leads off into the distance and the interpreters all intone, there's a caribou trail that's been there for eons and eons and eons. In reality, it's the remains of a horse trail to the Kantishna. I found blazes on trees that were many, many years old and I always wondered what and who put those blazes there. And I feel that it's important to know the landscape you live in. Like this evening before I was waiting for the program, I walked out on the bluff here and looked out over the Tanana Valley. And that view always amazes me. But I feel so empowered to know about the river out there, the Tanana, and the Wood River, and see the Wood River Buttes, and see Deborah, Hess, and Hayes, and in the distance, all the peaks. And I'm really happy that John, my friend John, took the time one time to explain to me that the Chena River at one time was really a slough back into the Tanana. And it explained why uh, Barnett and his captain were going up it when they got stuck because they were trying to get along around the shallows on the Tanana back into the river so they can continue upstream. I feel that if you live in a landscape and you don't study the history, you're impoverished in some way. You don't know what went on before you. You don't know what affected the current status of the land and the resources. And that's why I spent so much time doing these three histories. I began writing the first one in 1991, putting paper, words on paper, and I thought, well, I'll write an hour every day, and here in a couple of years I'll have my book finished. I'd studied Jack London and knew that he wrote a thousand words every day, and that he wrote Call of the Wild in a month. And in my naivete, I thought, well, I'll just write, crank this out and, and have it done in a couple of years. And that was the start of my book, Cantishna. It didn't get finished and published until 2006. So 1991 to 2006. That's the background. So we have the lights. I'll go through my program with you and show you some of these images. Cantishna was the first book. And it was the story of the pioneers that developed their gold claims on the north side, the miners, the mushers, and later the mountaineers that came into the country. The next book I wrote was a continuation of the first book, McKinley Station. And a really good historian would say that the, the best histories are written by historians that know what to put in the book and what to leave out. This book, I shoveled in everything I had. And for that purpose, it's not too readable for some people because what I tried to do is preserve all of the correct information as a record. It's readable, but you have to be into, in, into history to enjoy it. And then last year, The 70 Mile Kid uh, was the final book that I'm going to ever write about the history of this region. And it was about one of our more remarkable pioneers in the Tanana district, and that was Harry Karstens, who came into the country in 1897 as a 19-year-old runaway, and eventually led the first ascent of Mount McKinley. And this book is written as a narrative. It reads well, it reads fast, and it, I'd learned my lesson with McKinley Station, and I didn't shovel in everything that I could have. <coughs> This is the area that we're going to talk about. Here's uh, China and Fairbanks. And you go over the Cantishna River. And this, this, this area right here, these foothills, part of what we call the outer range of the Alaska Range today, is the Cantishna Mining District. Glacier City, Diamond City, Bear Paw. Those were some of the original gold rush uh, boom towns that were established in 1906. In 1903, one of the pioneers into Alaska, Judge James A. Wickersham, the federal judge for the 4th Judicial District, has, was a mountain climber. And he decided that he wanted to climb Mount McKinley. So in 1903, he started out with about the most ragtag band of climbers you could ever imagine. Here he is at the mouth of the Cantishna River. And they attempted to climb Mount McKinley 
and they were beaten back just because of weather and their own lack of experience. But they gave it a try in 1903. But because he tried it, and because, like everybody in that era, they did some gold panning on the way in, and they found some color in the Chitsia Hills, they went back to Fairbanks, which was a very small community in 1903, and bragged up how much gold they had found so that they could get other prospectors to rush in there. And in two years, that's exactly what happened. So it was his climb that actually was the impetus for the gold stampede into the Kantishna of 1905. At the same time he was going into the Kantishna from the south, Dr. Frederick A. Cook was launching his attempt on the mountain from the south from Cook Inlet, and he, as you many of you know, was quite the fraud and claimed a lot of things besides the summit of Mount McKinley. He claimed to have been the first person to the North Pole. In 1905, Joe Quigley and Joe Dalton discovered serious gold in the Cantish, the Quigley on Glacier Creek, and Joe Dalton on Friday and Eureka, Eureka Creeks. The first two claims, 1 and 1A, one on, on Eureka Creek were the richest in the Kantishna. In the way in the back here, you see a miner. This is a zoom in on him. And you can see the difficulty of, of mining on Eureka Creek. You had to move these huge slabs and these big boulders to get to the gold. But the first two claims were incredibly rich. It sparked even more interest in the Kantishna, so that in 1905 there was an incredible stampede into the Kantishna. But by 1906, those, cl those uh, claims had petered out, except for one or two hot spots here or there, and everybody started leaving. In the middle of the summer in 1905, when people were rushing into the Kantishna, there were as many people rushing out of the Kantishna had been had rushed in. Bear Paw City was on Glacier Creek where it run or excuse me, on Bear Paw River where it runs into the Kantishna. <coughs> Roosevelt was on the Kantishna River, but sixty miles from Moose Creek where the gold was found. Glacier City was a larger community that actually was going to be the center of mining on, for the Glacier Creek finds, but they dried up pretty quickly. There were one or two good claims there, and they dried up pretty quickly. And Diamond City was yet another uh, boom town that failed, and there was even yet another one called McKinley City. The Access to the Kantishna made it one of the most remote, difficult to access mining districts in Alaska, even more remote than the Kayakuk, the upper Kayakuk, because the waters fluctuated so greatly that it was difficult to get river boats up in there. It was difficult to have year-round access that was reliable. So there were trails that went about 170 miles across country from the Kantishna to Fairbanks, and one of the stops along the way on the Toklat River was Knight's Roadhouse. While I was doing my research, I had contacted the Karstens family and located uh, Harry Karstens' son, and then later his grandson after he died. We got to be fairly good uh, colleagues in doing research in history. And one night I was talking to him on the phone and I was explaining to him that I'd, you know, about some fact that I'd found out about his grandfather, uh, Harry Karstens. And I said, well, Bill Kotzenberg told me just the other day that, and whatever I said, and the, the phone went silent. And he said, you know Bill Kotzenberg? And I said, yeah, he lives in Arizona. He's your cousin, you know? And he goes, no, I don't know. This cousin of his was the lost uh, arm of the family, the Karstens family. And they had lost track of the Kotzenbergs for 40 years. And in my research over the decades, 
I've been in contact with both sides of the family, never realizing that he had made, they had no contact with one another. So one of the outshoots of my research was I was able to put these two branches of the family together. And this is an image of a four by five foot canvas uh, sign, if you will, that uh, Harry Karstens and his partner Charlie McGonigal had made to advertise their private freight service into the Kantishna in 1906. Charles McGonigal was Karsten's partner. They had met in 1903 when they were both hauling mail, pioneering the route from Valdez to Fairbanks hauling the mail. This is Karsten's in 1905 hauling freight into the Kantishna. And Harry had a very checkered experience with gold mining. So in the Kantishna, he decided to give up the mining. He'd remain partners with McGonigal, let McGonigal operate the mines, and he would do the freighting, the freight service into the Kantishna, both passengers and freight. And Harry, although he lacked any serious education, he was a 19, he was a 17-year-old runaway, never finished high school. Every place he went, he established a lending library. The materials might be old, but he really believed in the power of reading, and he would set up a lending library in the communities he worked out of, charging 75 cents each to haul a letter. Joe Dalton was one of the original pioneers on Eureka Creek. He had the richest claims, one and two. Uh, he was a crusty fellow, but he was friends with Karstens as well. The pioneers that came north to the 40-mile di uh, district in the 1870s were the real pioneers of northern development, northern gold development. And many of these individuals ended up in the Kantishna or were headed to the Kantishna. In this picture, you see Bill, Big Bill McPhee. Big Bill was a, a saloon keeper in both Dawson and in Fairbanks. And he had claims in the Kantishna. These guys' eyes lighted up because they knew that saloon keepers and storekeepers were the ones that really made the money sometimes way more than the actual miners and, and uh, prospectors. In this corner is Gordon Bettles, the notorious uh, trader, riverman. He was responsible for some of the wildest mining camps in Alaska and the upper Kayakuk. And if you know your Alaska history, he was involved in lynching a native person up on the Bremner River at one point, and he rushed into the Kantishna as well, and he started a failed community called McKinley, or Boomtown called McKinley City. Two of the earliest pioneers were the, were the Quigleys. Actually, they weren't married at the time. It was Fanny McKenzie and Joe Quigley, and they later married, and Fanny Quigley is a very famous figure in the Kantishna, you know, when I first read about her, I didn't really like her because all of the information about her and what the Park Service would say and what the lodge interpreter interpreters would tell people were these stories that made her sound like she walked on water, drifted over the tundra a few inches off the ground everywhere she went. And, of course, nobody's like that. And if you bear with me, I'm going to read you a letter from the book that she wrote to her sister. And I liked her a lot better after this because it made her more human. So let me read this to you. <clears throat> this is dated Glacier Creek, July 23rd, 1909. And this is where they are in this picture, Glacier Creek. My dear sister Mary, I received your letter some time ago and was sorry to hear that you lost your little girl. You didn't say what happened to her and which one you lost. I have not been very good this summer. I have been having teeth ache and there is no one to fix them here. I hope that you are getting along better than I am. I think that I have to come out and get me a home somewhere in Washington or Oregon. I get lonesome sometimes. I don't see any women. There is only one here, and she lives 12 miles from here. I can't leave my place so long 
to go to see her. She was over last May. I got only eight boarders this summer. Those were her employees on her claim. I don't know how my claim is going to turn out. I didn't get much last fall. I am busy fruiting up berries now and I got a big garden and five dogs to cook for and eight men so it keeps me going all day. If there was a little more money there, I would like to have you come out here for a year or so. You'd have to learn how to shoot a rifle and a 22 so you could get your own meat. Last fall I got two big moose and 12 sheep. I never got to kill bear. Well, I must close for this time right soon so I could get letter this fall. You see, we only get mail this spring, and that was April 25th. My best wishes to you, to you all, your sister Fanny McKenzie. It tells so much about what life was like there for a woman, um, alone with a bunch of men, working hard all day long, uh, isolated from her family so that she doesn't even know which niece of hers dies, male, very sporadic if it comes at all, and it made her very human to me. These were the size cabins that I found out in the Kantishna and in the park region they can be as small as six by eight. Imagine what it would be like to live in a six by eight cabin all winter long. It was very important that these prospectors and miners would partner up because you needed help if something went wrong. Slim Avery was in the Kantishna for about 40 years. The only law was the US commissioner the one big thing about many of the gold uh, mining districts in Alaska compared to the Yukon was over in the Yukon they had the Mounties that really kept the law. And if you've been following the news most recently, this spring in the uh, city of Dawson they found eight unmarked graves of men who had been hung by the Mounties at the turn of the last century for crimes that no one is sure what their crimes were. In Alaska, the US commissioner was post office manager. Uh, he was everything but really serious law. These were the commissioners from the Kantishna. So in my research, I found some things that were really troubling, and this was one of them. Imagine finding a note like this. I'm going to show you. This is the original note. This is what it says. All in. Cannot get the wood pile. So I either have got to freeze or shoot myself, Albert Morris. Dated February 4th, 1923. Here's an additional comment a little further down the page. Still the fifth. Have postponed hoping that someone would come, but no one did. Can't go any further. All the wood in the cabin is gone. A.M. And another script on the same piece of paper. February 5th, 1923. It is rather a joke to have a bunch of wood within 10 feet of the door and can't get it. I cannot go three steps, but my wind give out, and I drop any place for 15 or 20 minutes before I'm able to go on a step further. That was the last thing he wrote, and a few months later, they found his body where he'd shot himself on his bunk. Well, as a vest pocket historian, when I came across this original suicide note, I thought, what am I going to do with this thing? Should I share it? Should I not share it? or whatever, and I thought, you know, I can't leave it out. I just can't. It was in the probate records. They followed all the procedures back then. No one ever stepped forward to claim, to, to, uh, claim his remains or his property. So I know they made the effort, but what happened to him? What, what was the story? I said, I just have to um, illustrate what life was like there. So about a year after I published the book, one night at home, I got a phone call. And it went like this. Are you that guy that wrote that book about Kantishna? 
And I said, yeah, I'm that guy that wrote that book about Kentishna. He said, he said, uh, you wrote about my grandfather. And I said, who was your grandfather? And he said, Albert Morris. And I was a little shocked, you know, I didn't know what he was going to say. And he said, I owe you a big debt. I have to thank you. My grandfather disappeared during the Klondike gold rush, and my father spent his whole life trying to find out where his father went to and what became of his father. And he never found out. And he said, I promised my dad that one day I would find out what happened to, to his father and my grandfather. And so I gave him the information, and I know he contacted the state archives and got all the information about his great-grandfather, or me, excuse me, his grandfather. It was a terrible life of isolation out there. These two gentlemen on the left is Aloy Kine and Fred Houselman, little Fred Houselman, two Swiss. Aloy Kine was ill. In some way or other, he ended up in Fairbanks and he ended up in China Hot Springs. He spent two months at China Hot Springs soaking in the hot springs and drinking the water, trying to cure himself of the illness he had. Of course, he didn't cure himself. He came back to the little cabin here in the Kantishna and he was nursed by his friend and partner, Fred Halselman. And Aloy Kime died in that cabin just a month or two after this cabin or this picture was taken of stomach cancer. That next year, Fred Halseman was said to have gone mad and was shipped off south on the ferry or in the uh, steamship to Morningside Hospital in Portland to be treated for madness. And it was said that he was mad from watching his friend die. Madness was a side effect of the isolation, and there are a number of instances of it that have been recorded in the Kantishna. But what was really interesting about Hauselman's madness was, while he was outside being treated for madness, which he got over in two months and came back, the person that was placed in charge of his claim jumped the claim and when he came back, his property had been passed on to others. So there was some shenanigans going on there. And of course, the toll of isolation included the act of murder with murderous intent. Peter P.D. did willfully, maliciously, and with murderous intent shoot one John Even with a deadly weapon. In the Kantishna, the way you lived is you lived off the land. Fresh caribou meat <coughs> sold for different prices and was shipped off to the, camp, to the camps at Manly, Tanana, Ninana, and Fairbanks. My friend Jim Rudin one year was named uh, Historian of the Year for his book, Alaska Wolfman, about Frank Blazer. And what he did was he had written down all of the stories that Frank Blazer had told. And some of them, I think, were actually dangerous because they gave the wrong impression. They were, the, they were the, the memories of a person written down 50 years after the fact. And in fact, uh, to give you an example of why I think some of those stories are a little dangerous, if you don't uh, research them to find uh, corroborate, corroborating information is at one point Glacier says that in a certain spring year 500,000 caribou came through his camp he shot a bunch of them and then they went over, crossed the railroad stopped the railroad everybody on the train shot caribou then they went into Haley and everybody in Haley shot all of the caribou and that's an example of how many caribou there were before there was wolf control with poisoning in the 30s, and on and on and on. Well, I've never read anywhere else that there were that many caribou. And the remarkable thing about this story was because he was talking about a specific date, you could look it up in the Fairbanks News Minor or look for it in the Fairbanks Minor. So I went to the archives, looked for the date, looked it up, 
And sure enough, there was the story. A herd of caribou came out of the west, crossed the railroad tracks, stopped the train, people shot the caribou, the caribou went into Healy, people in Healy shot the caribou. Their estimation, the, the, the railroad engineer and the residents of Healy, their estimation of the number of caribou in the herd was 5,000, not half a million. <laughs> The one thing that really worried early conservationists in the United States were the number of sheep that were being killed in the Alaska Range. Tons and tons and tons of sheep were being killed. The meat is so wonderful and so delicious and so tender that there was just an endless market. And they always shot rams for the market. The ewes and lambs were shot to feed the dog teams. Harry Karstens, having a freight service into the Kantishna, saw all of these uh, dead sheep and the live sheep. And at that time, there were many, many thousands of sheep in the park area, what we call the park area today, in the Kantishna Hills. And uh, he made contact through Judge Wickersham with a rich eastern sportsman by the name of Charles Sheldon. And in 1906, they went up the Kantishna River. Karsten said, I know where you can get some sheep. And Sheldon was studying sheep and the relationship of doll sheep to stone sheep. He had spent the previous year in the, in the, the Yukon Territory studying uh, stone sheep. And he and Karsten spent the late summer and fall of 1906 in the Kantishna and the Toklat drainage hunting doll sheep. Sheldon came back for a whole year in 1907 and 08, and he collected specimens of all kinds in the shadow of Mount McKinley. The Quigleys visited him at the cabin he built on the Toklat River. And in the spring of 1908, Karstens hauled the trophies that Sheldon had gathered out to the Nana for later shipment to the National Collection and the Natural History Museum in New York. And on this particular trip, Karst Karstens was reported overdue and dead and buried in the Kantishna. That was the second time he was reported dead and buried that year. <laughs> he went back on his own after Sheldon left and market hunted and and pad for gold in the Kantishna. And of course, the Great Mountain is what dominates the center of the range. And the first per people to do a real serious attempt on the mountain was the uh, Lloyd Party in 1910, the Sourdough Party. This is Charlie McGonigal, Karsten's old partner, and Tom Lloyd, somewhere up on the glacier. And the partners, uh, this is Billy Taylor, Billy Taylor, Anderson, Pete Anderson, Charlie McGonigal, and Tom Lloyd. Uh, Anderson and Taylor made it to the North Peak. They never did make it to the South Peak, but Tom Lloyd told some whoppers and told everybody they all four made the South Peak. And of course, when they got back to town, the people that actually made the North Peak, nobody would believe they got anywhere because nobody believed Lloyd. One of the jumping off places for the climbs, the Pioneer Climbs, was Clearwater Fork off the McKinley River. And in 1913, Archdeacon Hudson Stuck uh, got together Harry Karstens and some others for an attempt on the mountain. And it was an all-Alaskan, almost all-Papiscopadian attempt on the mountain. This picture has never been seen in the public before. I just got this about a month and a half ago. This is, there's a lot of pictures missing from that era. And this is one I just discovered recently. Uh, Harry Karstens, Robert Tatum, and Walter Harper climbing below Gunsight Pass on Muldrow Glacier, the photograph by Hudson Stuck. This was in somebody's private collection on the East Coast. 
and it recently showed up on eBay. This is Karsten's Ridge. They go up this way to Prowns Tower into Harper Glacier between the two summits and to the summit of Mount McKinley, the true summit. This ridge leads to this point and then they cross like this under this overhang into the glacier. They go up here like this around and then up here to the south peak. And in 1913, June 7th of last year, uh, the 100th anniversary of the first ascent. The man who worked to, to get them all there and was the first person on the summit was Walter Harper, an Athabascan lad, by all means a brilliant, brilliant future ahead of him. But in 1918, he perished in the sinking of the Princess Sophia down near Juneau. In 1920, there was a resurgence after the Great War as men came back from the war to the Kantishna. They worked on the railroad and they also went out prospecting and mining. And this was the age in the Kantishna district of um, commercial mechanized mining of dredges and uh, hydraulic mining. That fellow there, Johnny Busia, would spend from 1920 into the middle 1950s living in the Kantishna. Furs trapping was an incredible financial boon to the district. There was a lot of poisoning. The poisoners were not popular with the real trappers and they ran the poisoners out, but yet it took a terrible toll on the fur bearers. Foxes, of course, were very valuable and many of the miners in the wintertime that stayed around were trappers in the wintertime. And here in Fairbanks at uh, some of the hardware stores, the catch from the Kantishna. There were some antimony mines in the Kantishna one red top quartz mine out on Friday Creek. And they would haul the ore out to the out to Roosevelt and then take it out by riverboat, but that failed because of the cost of transportation. This is the site of what we now call the Cantista Roadhouse. This building is still in existence. It was built in 1917 by Herbert Wilson, who was a mining engineer, for his bride. He was going to live out there and, and cash in on the silver that was being found, but there wasn't enough silver. And that's still in existence on the Kantishna Roadhouse property. And just downstream from the current property of the Kantishna Roadhouse is a hydraulic mining operation. And that went from about 1922 to 1923, and there wasn't a lot of gold in the finds. This is C. Herbert Wilson and his dog team in front of the home that he built for his wife. In 1920, there was the Copper Mountain Cop, Cop, the Copper Mountain Copper Strike. This, this, if the copper would have been there in the volume that they thought it was, it would have really changed things because there would have been a railroad spur built from the Alaska Railroad into the Copper Mountain Strike. And at the end of Wonder Lake in that era, which was outside the park, you could still homestead. A woman by the name of uh, Polly... Um, Anderson had a roadhouse, a 160-acre homestead at the end. Mount, the Mount McKinley would be right here, but in, with the poor quality of her camera, you can't see it because it's all washed out. But it's looking right down Wonder Lake. She had a, a fox operation, and she was also a miner. Her, her roadhouse was famous for pies and antler furniture that she made with her husband. And this was purchased back by the Park Service in the 30s. Fanny Quigley lasted out at her Eureka Creek, or excuse me, Friday Creek claim until the 50s. Johnny Busio was her friend and nearest neighbor. And he was buried in the Kantishna. And 
Uh, Fanny Quigley was buried here with, in Fairbanks up on Birch Hill at her wishes. And how each of them was found, neighbors would look across every morning at these isolated cabins, and if there was no smoke coming out of the chimney, they would go over to see if the individual was okay. And in both cases, that's how their deaths were discovered. And in 1921, um, after, excuse me, 1917, after many years of hard work, Charles Sheldon was able to bring before the Congress or help bring before the Congress a bill that would establish a Mount McKinley National Park. And at that time, uh, Judge Wickersham, who would attempted the first descent of Mount McKinley in 1903, was our uh, representative to Congress, non-voting member, but yet he was able to put the bill before the Congress to establish a Mount McKinley National Park, which was signed in the law by President Wilson. And just a couple months after he signed the bill into law, the United States entered World War I. It's nice to remember that the reason for the establishment of Mount McKinley National Park wasn't to protect the mountain. Fully two-thirds of it was outside the park in the initial boundaries, and it was to protect the large numbers of doll sheep. In 1917, Mount McKinley National Park was established, but it wasn't until 1921 that Harry Karstens assumed the first, or the position of the first superintendent of Mount McKinley National Park. And he went about evicting the market hunters and the poachers that were running rampant over that portion of the park. And it truly was that this park had a golden and bloody genesis. I always try to keep everything under an hour, and then I take just a few questions so that you can all get out and enjoy this beautiful evening. So I'll take three or four questions if you have any, and if you, after I take those three or four questions, if anybody wants to come up and ask further questions, I'd be delighted to answer them. Has anybody got any questions or comments? Yes, sir. How much gold was taken out of Friday Creek? Do you have any idea? I don't. I don't know the exact amount that was taken out of it. There was a state geologist by the name of Tom Bunsen who put out a fairly detailed report that gives the volumes. But there was some and not as much as people thought at that time. Uh, the, the miners that originally went there were placer miners. And by the quality and quantity of gold, they were always sure that somewhere there was a mother lobe. And so that led them into hard rock mining. Joe Quigley was one of those that developed like the banjo mine where he by hand drifted into the mountain 500 feet and then followed the drift as it went off on either angles, on either angle from the main drift. And they never did find that mother lobe even though they tried it on uh, Spruce, Moose, Glen Creek, a number of different locations. They were all going up onto the peak looking for the mother load, which they never found. But what was really interesting was prior to the uh, uh, enlargement of the park in 1980, the Nilka uh, process, there was a, a woman who had a small up gold, kind of a subsistence gold, placer gold panning operation on Friday Creek. And she leased it out to a guy from Talkeetna who brought in a cat, a backhoe, a front loader, and he uncovered a remarkable amount of gold. It was really, really remarkable how much he actually found. 
And what was really interesting about that was um, he trashed the whole area, left all kinds of junk and, and broken equipment and all this. And then after the park got the land a few years later, he got the contract to clean up his own mess. <laughs> it's the way the government works. But, uh, you know, that was one of the complaints of, of miners was there was an untapped reservoir of mineral wealth there that now was in a park and no one was ever going to uh, um, be able to access. And, of course, Earl Pilgrim over on Stampede Creek had a very active animony mine. Stampede Road led there to his animony mine. And animony was at one time or another very valuable it's not so valuable anymore, but his mining operation was also impacted by the by the Anilka process. And that was another one of those things I just had to laugh about. Since I don't work for the Park Service, never have, never one who I can say these things. But at one point, they brought the Army in to clean up the EOD, Explosive Ordnance Demolition, to clean up the the explosives that Earl Pilgrim had left behind in one of the buildings. So they placed some charges back there and they were gonna, it was going to be a controlled explosion and they all went a little ways away. Pretty soon, it was like World War II, the whole thing went up and then it was, oh, we should have saved some of these historical buildings that are now splinters. <laughs> so, so there are people in the mining industry, in the mineral, mineral industry that think the Cantitianists should have been excluded from the enlargement of the park, but that's what they believe. Any other questions or comments? Yes, sir. I always assumed the disappearance of the doll sheep in the Cantitian Hills was a result of commercial hunting, but did you say that they established, the park was established to protect those yes. sheep? So yeah. what caused the uh, disappearance of the uh, It's very interesting. It's a very good question. Um, at one time, uh, you can you can uh, you can put this in the world realm of myth or whatever. But at one time, there was an estimated 10,000 sheep in the, in the area that is now the park and in the Kantishna Hills. Uh, now we probably have 1,600. In 1927 and 1932, first in 1927 there was an incredible snowstorm at exactly the wrong time of year. And literally, I witnessed accounts of hundreds and hundreds of sheep starving to death. Hundreds. And then in 1932, there was, after cat, or lambing in the spring, there was a real late snowstorm, rainstorm that put ice on the plants so that nothing could eat them because these animals have to be able to paw through loose snow to get to the forage. And almost all the lambs died. And it has never recovered from that, uh, those two twin blows. And if you look at the history of doll sheep in Alaska, you will see that similar losses occurred in other parts of Alaska. When I first got here in the 60s, it was illegal to sheep hunt in the Brooks Range because they had not recovered from a, a big die-off up there. And it wasn't until, like, I don't know, Dale Guthrie was here, he could tell us, but like 69 or 70 before sheep hunting was legal again in the Brooks Range. And for example, down in the Kenai, that was renowned for very, very large sheep. And there was also a die-off down there that those animals had never recovered. And now we have the circumstance where they believe in global warming or not, a lot of the ground cover in the park has changed. And of course, because this is all alpine, it's affected by the change in vegetation. Or, I mean, the vegetation is changed by sunlight, longer, shorter, winters, whatever, and, and that habitat has changed. So I don't think there are ever going to be as many sheep as there once was. Same with caribou. Car I, I could show you some old pictures and compare them to the ones I could take today. And places like out near Pauley, Anderson's Roadhouse, of the hillsides, not a bush on them. Now they're all brush and tree covered. That was once caribou habitat, not anymore. So that's the long-winded 
comment. Yes, sir. Well, that was true for a while, but then there was some kind of congressional legal activity that made it all illegal. There was a point in time, I can't remember exactly when after Anilka, mid-80s when mining was outlawed in the additions to the park. So then they sold, a lot of people sold them back to the government. And some of the, some of the private development out in the Kantishna today are on old claims where private people kept them and did not sell them back to the government, didn't want to sell them back to the government. Okay. Pardon? But it was possible to keep. Yes, they couldn't, they couldn't condemn it, thanks to Ted Stevens. They had to pay fair market value, which was name your price, and that was fair market value. Anybody else? Yes, sir. This will be the last one. Since most of this uh, early uh, exploration and, and uh, mining was done prior to the Alaska Railroad, uh, I assume that uh, freight probably came from Fairbanks down the Tanana, Unana River, and then what happened? The, the, m most of the freight went from Fairbanks down the Tanana, the Tanana up the Kantishna to either Roosevelt and then 65 miles overland, or it went up the Kantishna to the Bear Paw, and where Bear Paw City was, which the Bear Paw is a tributary of the Kantishna, there was a little Bear Paw City, which was the head of navigation, navigation normally on years when there was water. And then from there it went overland. Um, the, one of the reasons why some of the mining, like silver, uh, failed in the Kantishna was because of difficulty in getting it out, getting the ore out, and the un unpredictability of the water levels for for riverboat transportation. Okay, thanks everybody for coming. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. Oh, is he up there? John has a light these days. Oh, yeah. Is he back out there again? Well, he's been out there full time for a while. No, but I mean, was he making a sign up? Oh, he just comes in town. And I wish I could remember all the conversations that were whirling around me. I, my sister and I stayed at Johnny's 
He was sort of in charge of us on weekends when we were just playing on the creek, you know. So it's just very wonderful to hear about all the things I I was there, but I missed out on it. Bill Mann used to talk about you all the time. Yeah. Yes, Jenny. We lived with them a lot. I don't know where you And Jenny, Jenny would take me out there to plantation. You know, we. I was thinking we we hiked up the creek. We waited at the creek. To see a mine, to where someone named Slim was mining, an old, very old man. Slim Avery. I wonder who was it, and she was taking him mail and he had big food and he had big lunch up there. It was wonderful because there was no trail. I don't think we waited the creek. What was it across Moose Creek? Because I think his claim was uh, Elmer Lava Creek, which is a crossing. I don't remember the crossing. I just remember walking a long time because it was wonderful the rocks and everything waiting in the street. Very well kept in mind. It wasn't a usual mess. But anyway, yes, Jenny. So that was, I still have letters, because it sounds like her voice, it sounds like she's talking, I mean, she, was, she was extremely important in our life, and Surprise. He, was, he wasn't the most talkative, but I know. he was sort of in the background all the time. Well, you know, at the end of his life, he and I were really good friends, and I did a history of his World War II experiences. It's now in the World War II Museum, or in the World War II Museum and Library in New York. Oh, really? Yeah, he was, uh, he was one of the few 101st Airborne officers to survive the entire war. And he never had told Re any of that. Yeah. Wow. That's a, yeah. yeah. What an amazing guy. Well, yeah. Uh, well, anyway, well, I hear you heard him. He saw our duck. Yeah. Our golden, our golden your wife, duck. Your wife yeah. I'm going down to see him this weekend. <laughs> it was nice, nice to meet you. Hi. Thank you. After other things, you can go back to the really some of the red top lines. Yep. You can go in with the Park Service has some money to meet. No. Well, well, that's a really a good question. Some of them are preserved, and some of them have been hauled away. And they, they, what, one of the worries a lot of people have is right now there's a, a new assessment of the condition going on, and, and they think a lot of it's going to be. Well, that's a good question. Well, Some of us have the same exact question. Yeah. 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 Not very many anymore. There's not that less than 10. Right. In that area, because there's some on the south side, but I know right in that there, area about right there across the river, there's a little slew on the back side. Well, if you think I'm right at the bottom of the house, I'm going to say the last time I saw it. Oh, well, I think it starts by name. Good to see you, John. Sure. Uh, yeah, we were yeah. 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 Yeah.
There's a lot more private land around there. A lot more. Yeah. 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 Yeah
And it wouldn't work. I watched them take off and put a trail in. Make the turtle and the ridges, and I thought, these knuckleheads don't have any survival gear. They don't have any. They're wearing their. They're going, they're wearing a go to town shoes. Oh, Jeff, my beautiful. Well, it all worked out in the end, but that's a chance you don't take very often. Oh, I know you do. Well, that's what I mean. Yeah, I'm not going to let you forget it either. I, I, yeah, what's that now? You're indebted to me forever because I saved your life? Yes. Hey, did you get rid of your uh, yeah, they were going to go south on it before, like, miles before Europe. Because you killed them. It's a long little lake trail that's right across. And they got a little yeah. trail that's just yeah. in the woods. I mean, you yeah. have to yeah. know where it you know. is. Okay, it's that place yeah. that you can go on. Yeah, you have to go across to Genoa. Yeah, it's that thing. We plenty should get there. There's moisture. Because the water makes that. There's a little soil across the lake, and then there's a little spot. Yeah, it's just 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 a I know. The river. Well, and there's a. Yeah. If you're so there's no end. Yeah, I just read one about a woman named Stratford de Laguna. We flew out there. Back in the thirties, she and another archaeologist. They took a train to the end of the city, built boats under the railroad bridge, and then floated down the town of the Arctic. John Hanson Lake, huh? that's where the Hanson brothers that were. Yeah, Emil, Emil John and. I don't say what his name. I want to say Eggle, but not. Yeah, and not so when evil. you're on that river, you're yes. uh, yeah. I'm on the same river. Uh, I'm experiencing the same stuff. That. It's really not that I just different. got a whole folder of stuff from Gene Bryant the other day. Oh, you did. Yeah, John. You know John Birch? Sure. He's he's a good friend. He's got my up there. But so Roosevelt, we. We recovered the trail from Bear Potter Roosevelt yeah. last year. Yeah. Peter Kazanoff and some others. Peter since died. But, um, he, uh, Roosevelt, they were supposed to have hauled hundreds of tons of ore to Roosevelt. They Roosevelt's gone now. It's all washed away. And we found the trail towards Glacier, but we couldn't. It was too, too brushy to follow. <laughs> but um, trying to figure out anything around there, all this is one cabin. The trail to um, to uh, Cantitiona itself, in places you can see really clearly from you can the You can see air. it on the air photo pretty well. Yeah. 
but on the ground it's yeah. It's well, nice. well, I've been on some of it, and there's some places where because a lot of those places they use corduroy. Yeah, it was all corduroy. At one time they you could take a wagon from one place. They took well, they hauled they 150 hauled, tons of ore. Maybe I, it's more than that. I have that in one of the books there because I wrote. I remember looking at it, a it's huge amount of ore. And then they hauled it down yeah. the river. You know, somewhere either uh, on the mouth of the Kantishna or I think maybe some of it is at Roosevelt. When they were trying, it would have been uh, 20 and 21, they were trying to bring in that hydraulic, that uh, dredge. Pipe. Yeah, and a, yeah, but a dredge. Mm -hmm. And there are parts of the dredge down there somewhere. Not to my knowledge has anybody found one. Yeah. So you Unfortunately, need the guy at the mountain. <laughs> well, we found that we found the paddle wheel just above uh -huh. Percy's upper yeah. place on the there. Yeah. There's rumors of a paddle wheel steamer on a, one of those sloughs between the Turners and the Bear Plot. I've heard that story too. But Mike doesn't. Mike doesn't know where it is. Yeah. Nate. You know Nate. Nate Turner. Nate Turner. He's yeah. he's the historian of the Turner uh -huh. family. Mm -hmm. he, he knows lots of that stuff. But I've been fascinated by Roosevelt. There's Finding anything on the ground is really hard. Mm -hmm. And the other thing I was trying to figure out is they talked about hauling 50-ton scows to Diamond. We've been there in high water, and you know, in my riverboat with a prop, you're, you're taking your chances getting there. Yeah, I know. I know. And how'd they ever get that big of a boat up there? I have no idea. It's a tiny river yeah. by the time you get up there. Yeah. We got, last year we went up to Glade to Diamond. And we got about five or six miles up towards the glacier in a little, little seven and a half horse with a flat bottom and ran out of water. Mm -hmm. And fairly high water. Mm -hmm. And they got big boats to, you know, to dive in. And they got pretty good sized boats to glacier at one time or the other. Yeah. But that's, this winter we're going, we're going to spend the month of March up there. Mo mo most of the, the head of that navigation was really near Foss City. It would stop there. When there was water. So Bearpaw City, there's Bearpaw Village, yes. where the Rex Trail crosses the old slough. Mm -hmm. There's a, a roadhouse there. There was Bearpaw City, there was places right on the mouth of the Bearpaw in the Cantish. Yes, there was. Jill and I found the... Is that where Bearpaw City was, at the mouth? That's what I understand, yes. Because Bearpaw Village is still there. Yeah. Bearpaw Village, we went walking around in the woods there 20 years ago. And found a foundation for something like 30 by 40, a big building, mm -hmm. but you know, just yeah. just logs. Yeah. We went back looking for it a few years ago couldn't and find it. couldn't find any. Yeah. yeah, and I wasn't clear whether the Cantician had come in and wiped that out. What we had found, because yeah. the Cantician is moving that way. Yeah. But um, well, the the, the main so reliable so point of entry was always Roosevelt because it had no water. It was just that one bar below Roosevelt yeah. that stopped. Well, yeah, but who knows what what that bar was like in 1920. Yeah, right. I can tell you what it's like now. Yeah. <laughs> well, my friend John knows, too, because he's been at the Moose Island. John. John who? John who? That fellow there in a white T-shirt. Oh, really? Before I, he had a stroke, he's put to home. Huh, yeah, we've been up there every year for 20-some years. Mm -hmm. uh, so, but... Yeah, we got moose up there last year. Just up by Children of the Lake. But Roosevelt was fascinating to see how big of a town it was. And just on the ground, you can't find anything. It, it, it basically lasted less than a year. And then in the 20s, they used some of the old buildings for it. Was all the old did, all did, that stuff. Did, did, I, did I read a, a story a number of years ago? Somebody from Glass or China or something? There was that. Was that Roosevelt? Finding what? Um, you know, dishes? Yes, dishes and, and glassware. Well, there were there, there's a couple of people who are, who are around the park. Is that Diamond? Diamond. Diamond. It's still there. Yeah. There, there are a couple of people who are around the park who hauled out a whole lot of stuff back in the early 70s by the dog team. And I've seen a lot of stuff. And they want, um, her private collection. Uh, there was a pilot by the name of Shailen Harris, and he had the original Benalla Air. And if you if you look on the internet, you can probably find his book. 
Shailen, C-H-A-L-O-N, Shailen Harris. And he talks about in there going in a cabin and finding all this stuff just exactly as if somebody had walked away from it. Like you're talking about. Diamonds are still kind of that way. There's rocker boxes in the ridges. Yeah. We were just there but Diamond's that. privately owned, isn't that? Yes, yeah, but, uh, to that Mark, yes, Mark Wason. Can, Candy Waterman sold it to her. Oh, really? Really? Yeah, Candy she owned. used to own it. So Shailen what's Harris. His name? Shailen Harris. It, he's in Idaho and he's got, he printed all these books about his reminiscences of. Excuse me a second. Sure. Shit. Sure. Um, he printed these reminiscences of his time in the Camp Ishna, and and one of them is a story going in that cabin and finding the remains of that car. Because there's a there's a beautiful old Polaris snow machine up there. Um, there's log books from when it was a post office. Good. there, but the book I think it was even in your book. Or that stuff I just got from Jane. It said there was 170 cabins in Diamond. There's not enough ground for 170 cabins. There. I, I don't believe that at all. That's way too many. Yeah. But just two different, two different places had. One of them had 150 cabins. And the other one had 170. And they both reported the news. Well, and it may be from the same source. Oh. So it may yeah. not be two separate sources. Yeah. Well, so, thank you, Tom. Yeah. I share your yeah. thank you. enthusiasm for history of whatever we like. Well, thank you, sir. Yeah. Have you been to the hot springs out there? Yeah. No, I never There's have. two hot springs yeah, at Bear On the Toklad? No, I've been to the Knights a bunch of times, but there's two of them within 10 miles of Diamond. On the Alaska hot springs map. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't know. Yeah, so that's the goal for this winter. <laughs> that's the goal for can, Long Island. Uh -huh. Can we get your name and yes, phone sure. number? Okay. Yeah, I'm, 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 I'm just really up on the point. I'm living up at, um, well, I'm just renting a place for the moment. I, you know, I really need to get going in the end of this, this uh, impoverished uh, Well, my, uh, yeah, thank you. our son my lives. Education. So yeah, talk yeah, about yeah. education and living in far from places. Our son lives in Manhattan. Oh, good Lord. <laughs> Here. Good Lord. Right. I'm trying to find something. Well, right. Here we go. What, no, what, I don't um, think so. Are you yeah. what, uh, what is um? I I was kind of sponsored and supported by the Red Hackles. Oh, uh, nice. Who I came to play for years and years ago. So. I mean, any guy you know can uh, That's a, a fine enough reference. Um, I grew up listening to music like that because my mother was in love with it. Oh, right. The right. Sir Harry Lauder yeah. records <laughs> were what she had. And then she had all these bagpipe music. Yeah, no, are you hanging out on eBay? Or Sorry, my dear. No, I, I, thank you. I'm, I'm good. I'll just. Uh, it was these I was oh. needing. Yeah. Yeah. We're not getting any younger. You don't strike me as eBay. Yeah. So can you know where we think it came from? That is, when most of Stuck's pictures are missing. Most oh. of them are missing, except for reproductions from Airbrook. Yeah, yeah, it's Garrick. About two yeah. years Garrick. ago. The old farmer's loop. I know this, I've been there about. Oh, Greenwich. Oh, Greenwich. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. From a talk he gave somewhere about the Episcopal oh, Church for fundraising. Started showing, started showing up on the evening. Yes, and yes. Oh, yeah. 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 Yeah.
started showing up were just copies from the four original negatives. They were like put finishing A and P. Hopefully A and P doesn't finish me. I'm sure you'll do oh, fine. Water. What a task. Just don't breathe in too much dope. Yes. Yes. I was I wanted to do a dope and fabric when I was younger. Oh, nice. My father talked me out of it. He said you won't live long enough if you keep breathing that. Do you guys want my dad did, right. but I don't. Well, I, I hope, hopefully, I'm, I'm, you know, I, I, yeah. I got to get yeah. it. Yeah, I called Ken Carson. Yeah. Yeah. But I don't know what way to do it. It'll be expensive, but it'll be something that will be useful for you. Well, yeah, it's a good way to get around. It's not easy because it's not easy to fly so here. But the people who keep know what they're doing go places that everybody else can get to. He has like 50 copies of. Yeah, well, that's different. I'm glad of my edition, and then he's got you know film of Ralph, but he's got this huge collection of photos and family stuff. And Harry Carson's wife is a pack rat, and they have trunks and all these. Cool. What a cutie she looks like. She had lines of original. But you know his. His dad tells an interesting story that they were in Texas. And one day his dad said, Oh, we got all this stuff from my grandpa. And he says, Where is it? He says, Oh, it's on the barn. He walked out of the barn and just raised it. He has the trunk coat. And right behind him, there's a hole in the water. He said, He's got the trunk. 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 I mean, a little water, 